Welcome to Money Matters TV. My name is James Chen in Philadelphia. My consulting practice is Asia Marketing and Management. I help manufacturers and national associations do business in China and Asia. I would like to introduce my co-host, Mike Dever. Mike Dever is CEO and uh, founder of his practice in 1982. He actually founded his practice a year before me. So uh, he's, uh, he's more of an entrepreneur than I am, I must <laughs> say that. So uh, welcome to the show, uh, Mike. It's good to Thank have you. Thank you very much, James. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we have uh, quite a few minutes, not too many, but, but, but quite a few minutes. Mm -hmm. So why don't you talk about one of your favorite subjects, uh, particularly uh, now in this current time, which is about retirement and particularly retirement for people who either are already retired, how do they invest their assets, their, their capital, or uh, for people who are thinking of retiring? Yeah, that's it. I mean, I think it's such an important issue anytime, but this time uh, I think it's even more so because we've just had uh, such a tremendous bull market over the last decade. And then, right. you know, today, you know, till, till now, and we've got a lot of stocks like Tesla entering the S&P 500 at a, an 1100 price to earnings ratio. Uh, so you have a lot of potential risk in the market where it's been full risk on since the COVID crisis recovery, full risk on with people pouring money in. So I've had a lot of questions from people that are either in retirement, um, my father-in-law being one of them, um, or nearing retirement about what they should be doing with their money. And, and it's, it's a really, really great question because you want to try to preserve some, some, some income um, through your retirement years, but at the same time, when the market's as frothy as it is, you know you're going to be taking on a lot of risk. Alternatively, oh, you, you have bonds that aren't yielding anything. Go ahead, James. Yeah, I, 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 sorry to, to interrupt you, but I just want to make a point clear here. Are you talking about people with assets who don't have a, an, an investment advisor and who are therefore well, relying on themselves, their own skills to invest the assets? Is that what you are saying or it doesn't matter? It, it well, I mean, it, the same thing really holds with if they have an investment advisor because okay. the investment advisor may have some biases or some okay. um, pre-existing ideas on where they think the, the money should be that might not always, in, in all cases, be suitable for each individual investor. Okay. And so it really does apply. Now, if you've got a defined defined benefit plan, you've got a set amount of money you're earning every month. That doesn't really address that. That's that's a different issue and. That, that's up to the defined benefit plan, you know, managers to deal with. But yes, on the 401k, IRAs, you know, how should that money be invested? Um, you've got a big dilemma between whether you take the risk or you diversify more into bonds where you give up return. And um, our, you know, our point on that and what we've been kind of looking at for investors is trying to come up with a, um, a combination that gives them the ability of having some exposure to equities, but having some protection on that at the same time. So rather than simply being naked, exposed, buy and hold S&P, be in the S&P, but have some protection where if the market does sell off substantially, you only are exposed to a small amount of that sell off. What about for people who are on the, uh, on the a tad conservative side? In other words, they are too afraid to see the market drop precipitously. There's always that scare. So uh, should they stash aside like cash and and how much cash do you think i i know it's a dumb question but like right. I'm, I'm curious yeah well if if you're going to be long the s p and you're in retirement you're, you're relying on that money to, to sustain you through your retirement right. um and you've got 20 plus years that you're thinking you're going to need that money for you, you can't just put it into cash or even into intermediate or longer term bonds now because you're not going to yield probably that much for you. But at the same time, you've got that, that huge open-ended risk in equities. So um, I think you still need to have some equity exposure. You know, what, what we've been developing at Brandywine is a product that gives them protection on that exposure. So they're able to, to maintain it, truly buy and hold without worrying about if the market collapses 50% or the, just recently this year, earlier this year, 34% um, peak at draw off in the S&P 500 during the COVID crisis. 
Um, with the right protection in place on that, you can limit that to a single digit loss, which gives you the ability of preserving your capital and growing from a higher base subsequent to that. Do you have some kind of a, um, oh, not a formula, but you know, a percentage, like a pie chart, how much of what should be here and how much of the other should be there? You know what it, I'm saying? Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, so the traditional way that people would do it is with a target date fund where they, uh, as they near retirement, they pull more money and maybe they start out their 70, 30 stocks and bonds and they start end up going more 50, 50 and it might even end up going 40% bond or stocks to 60% bonds as they're into retirement and they want to preserve that principle more than worry about the return that they could possibly earn on it. Um, and that is one way to go about doing it. Um, you know, what we've developed is an alternative to that that allows you to have higher percentage invested in the equity side uh, instead of just having it move out of equities. So it still preserves the opportunity for the upside, but protects the downside using um, option strategies in the portfolio. Yeah. Now, then are you also addressing institutions or are you addressing high net worth individuals or both? Um, right. So it's historically for us, it's been high net worth to institutional. And uh, one of the products that we're working on now to roll out for uh, second quarter next year is something that can go into any IRA, any IRA plan, uh, a lot of 401k plans, but it'll start getting put into those 401k plans. So when people look at the list of options they have, they'll have Brandywine Protected 500 as one of the options instead of just the S&P 500. Sounds good, sounds good. Now, talking about high net worth individuals, I'm sure that these people run the full gamut, you know, uh, I mean, what is high net worth? Are you talking about people with at least two million, or with at least five million, or, or what? Right. Yeah. So, so, for, so with our current product, it's two million up, uh, okay. investable assets. You know, okay. with the new product, it'll be you know any it can be my son who just started his first full time job. Um, but as of now, yes, it's it's two million dollar portfolio in type investors on up. Yeah, I I want to jump back to a very fundamental question: Why? Do you feel that there is an interest in kind of retirement strategies for for retired people or would be retirees? Why? Yeah, I think it's twofold. Right now we have the 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 big bulge going through with retirees. So we got the, the baby boomers, a lot of these people are retiring. So you're hitting a a period where the retirees in relation to the overall population is growing, growing fairly substantially. And the second part of that is where traditionally they could move some of that money into bonds and get a five or ten percent return on it. They can't do that today. You know, so there's a lot more questions that they have in retirement. It's not as simple as I'm gonna take my money out of stocks, put it into bonds, and live off the income. It's hard to live off a 90 basis point income. Yeah, okay. Well, Mike, I know that you can go on because there's so much to talk about, but how about if you are to answer a question uh, from Money Matters TV uh, viewers? And the question is from Jack Thomas of Philadelphia, uh, which is, what's a hedge fund and how does it work? So a hedge fund is really simply um, a, a fund that instead of being, say, a mutual fund, which is a, a fund structure regulated by the SEC, a hedge fund, is it's, it's got regulations, but it's not registered. And so it's because of that, it's only available to higher net worth investors. Um, that does give a little more flexibility in how that fund can operate than a traditional mutual fund can operate. So it can actually include hedges in the portfolio to, to protect better against the downside. In a lot of cases, hedge funds are just leveraged long equity funds. They're, they're not really hedging at all necessarily. So you really need to look at the, uh, the documents to understand what they're doing. Not all hedge funds, actually a lot of them, majority maybe even, don't hedge. Do, do just, just a short uh, pick a union question on hedge funds. People, high net worth individuals, <coughs> if they happen to be managing their own money without either an institutional advisor or individual advisor, do they have to rely on an institution or someone else to, to deal with the hedge fund or not? Can they, they, they do, right, they do not. They could go directly into the, uh, the hedge fund themselves. The difficulty is in finding those funds uh, because they aren't uh, publicly available. 
There are lists like there are with mutual funds. So that's why a lot of people get into hedge funds through an advisor that has access and knowledge of funds. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, sure. How about right now we'll, uh, we'll pause and for the viewers to know that here is how you send your questions to Money Matters TV. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, send us your questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com. Welcome back to Money Matters TV. My name is James Chan. I have a consulting practice, which is called Asia Marketing and Management. I founded it in 1983. I'm still working at it. Um, and today, uh, I'm very happy to announce we have a very talented uh, person. Uh, I spoke with him. His name is Dr. He has a PhD. Dr. Vahan Janjajan. Uh, Vahan, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Vahan, welcome to Money Matters TV again. You've been here before. Yes, I have. Thank you. Yeah. So now uh, I have uh, not only spoken with you, but I also look at your website, your company's website, uh, Greenwich Wealth Management. Can you tell people something about the firm? Uh, and, and also, I understand you have been uh, the chief investment officer. So tell people what do you actually do? And of course, Mike, you can, you can feel free to jump in at any time. Okay, Mike? Yeah. Um, so Greenwich Wealth Management was started in 2006 by Michael Freeberg. Uh, who had a uh, background of uh, trading in both bonds and uh, commodities. And he started up an investment advisory. So Greenwich Wealth Management is an independent SEC registered investment advisory. We are uh, fiduciaries. Um, and we have uh, primarily high net worth individuals as clients. Um, but we also have some clients that are um, a, little bit, a little bit smaller. Um, so we, uh, we do have some clients that are a little bit smaller. We have a $1 million minimum, but most of our clients are somewhere around the two to $3 million range. Um, okay. we invest primarily, um, by using, uh, individual stocks and ETFs. We create, um, uh, portfolios for each individual based on their objectives and constraints. And we take their, um, their ability to tolerate risk into, into consideration. Um, we are a uh, several uh, investment advisors all working under the, uh, the same umbrella. Um, but the firm has approximately uh, $1.2 billion under management right now. Oh, wow. Now, uh, I may be jumping the gun. Uh, when we talked last time, you said that you have two books. Both of them uh, have a very uh, uh, appealing or memorable titles. Would you like to talk about your books? Because they're um, related. Well, yeah, the, fir the first book I published is called Even Buffett Isn't Perfect. Um, and uh, the title was meant to be ironic, of course, because uh, uh, Warren Buffett is considered one of the greatest investors of all time. But even he admits that he has made some uh, investment mistakes. Um, and so I do point out uh, a couple of his investment mistakes, but my, my bigger criticism uh, has to do with policy issues. Uh, for example, his views on corporate governance and uh, earnings guidance, um, his view on how stock options should be expensed, his views on taxes. Um, and I, I really had no intention of writing this book, uh, but I had written several articles about uh, Warren Buffett for uh, Forbes magazine. And so the publishing company approached me and suggested that I write this book. So that, that's how that book came around. And then the second book is called the Forbes CFA Institute Investment Course. And it was a collaboration between 
um, Forbes uh, and the CFA Institute. So it's a uh, it's a primer on how to invest. It talks about the basics of investing. It's an excellent source for uh, beginning investors. Yeah. Now it's it's interesting. Uh, again, going back to our conversation, which I enjoy very much, that you 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 actually are very skilled, very good at a number of things. You almost you kind of remind me as a Renaissance person. I mean, you were good at science and. And, uh, and 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 sports, and then suddenly you now became a, an investment uh, uh, officer. How 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 did this kind of journey happen? Can you just, in a nutshell, tell people your your whole life experience, maybe in one minute, if you can manage? <laughs> well, well, thanks for the compliment. I really appreciate that. Um, so yes, I, I was. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia. I moved to Southern Virginia to take a job at a manufacturing company. And while I was there, I got a truck driver's license and I also did a little bit of driving. I used to drive these 18 wheelers. That was a lot of fun. Um, and that was my first exposure to business. I was a science major in, in college, um, with the intention of possibly going to dental school, but I, I decided very quickly on that that wasn't for me. So uh, I loved business. I decided to get an MBA. I went to Virginia Tech because it was the local university. And mm -hmm. while I was there, I was invited to stay on for a uh, PhD in finance. Um, I did that uh, for one reason was because it allowed me to continue with my training. I was a pretty serious runner at the time. Um, and then after I completed my doctorate, I took my first academic position at the University of Delaware. I, um, I taught courses in uh, corporate finance and investments. And when I was in my last academic position at Boston College, I was approached by uh, Forbes, the publisher of Forbes magazine. Uh, they asked me to be the editor of their investment newsletter. And so I, I served as the editor for, uh, for many years. Uh, my track record uh, turned out to be very good. And as, as a result, I had a number of people approach me and ask me to manage money for them which I couldn't do as an employee at Forbes. So I left Forbes in 2010 and joined uh, Greenwich Wealth Management uh, to uh, manage money for these people who had approached me. Yeah, uh, this is a fascinating story. But to me, one thing seems like a constant, which is, and I'm talking about entrepreneurship because I've been through myself uh, that, and I'm sure that Mike uh, uh, may want to add to this, that a, a, an entrepreneur is somebody who is able to see a rising opportunity. I mean, when I say rising, something comes up. People come to you and ask you to manage their money. I mean, if you still don't know how to say yes, you can be successful as an entrepreneur. Mike, don't you agree? <laughs> no, I, I, I have so many people in the years who have ideas of what they want to do as a business, yeah. but they never pull the trigger and never take action. So their, their ideas are creative people, but they're not entrepreneurs. In other words, I, I'm trying to say, if you if you trip over opportunities and you still can't see them, <laughs> right. that's just like, no, no. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, but, you're not an entrepreneur, no question. No. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to bogart uh, the the asking process uh, with uh, Vahan. So, Mike, you have a question for Vahan? Well, I, I, I want to just circle back real quick. The um, do you, the I get asked all the time. This morning, I got asked one more time again. What's the best book for somebody just starting out investing to get? And so, I was wondering if that book that you you wrote there, um, the CFE Institute, is is that base level enough for someone who says, I've been hearing about this Robin Hood stuff. I'd love to invest. How can I learn about it? Yeah, it is base level enough. However, you know, um, I, I don't like tooting my own horn. So uh, I will recommend two other books that I think are okay. absolutely excellent. Um, one is called A Random Walk Down Wall Street by yeah. Burton Hockfield. It's a, it's a well-known book. It's probably in its uh, 12th edition, right. but I'm not sure. Wow. Um, and it's a great book for beginners to read. And uh, another one is called uh, Common Sense Investing by Jack Bogle, uh, mm -hmm. who I used to know. Unfortunately, he passed away a, a few years ago. Right. Um, and he's also a, a very good source of information. So those two books I would highly recommend. Okay. Do you know, is there one that's more nuts and bolts? Um, like, a, here's what 
here's how you short sell here here when you open a brokerage account this is what margin investing means uh do they cover that i don't i think they i don't think of them as being that type of book maybe like a dummies book well, our book, uh, the Forbes, uh, the CFA Institute um, investment course does cover that. However, okay. I, would, uh, I would warn uh, beginning investors, uh, you know, shorting stocks is not something you want to do until you get quite a bit of experience. Sure. Yeah. I, it's just a question of a lot of these people want to know what, what it means. They, they don't necessarily want to do it. They just have heard about it. You know, they want to know what, what it all means. Yeah, we do explain that in the book. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, because I had one last night called and said, oh, my. You know, I was looking at a stock and I, he wanted to short it, but he said, my wife told me that's illegal. You can't short stocks. You know, so they don't know anything. <laughs> well, well, technically, you know, it, it, it is sometimes illegal. If the broker can't borrow the shares, they can't allow you to short it. That, that's, that's a good point there. And it was illegal in the financial crisis for a period of the financial stocks as well. Yeah. 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 Talking about crises. Well, uh, Vahan, can you or would you be willing to talk about one or two challenges at your firm with either less than easy clients or a situation that is really very difficult uh, to um, manage. Well, I'm sure you probably never had any, right? You probably never lose any money. <laughs> right. ever, right? Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I, well, I would say this year was a great example because, uh, you know, as we started off the year and the pandemic started and all of a sudden the market collapsed, um, you know, I had clients who suddenly got very nervous and, and wanted to get out of the market. Um, and then when the market uh, had rallied uh, about 30%, uh, they were then ready to get back into the market. Um, and, and this is a very difficult thing to, to do when you're an investor because it's, it's human nature to want to buy when everything looks good and to want to sell when you're scared, when you should exact, exactly be doing the opposite. So I, I, try, I try to stress I know Mike was talking about this earlier. I try to stress the concept of uh, asset allocation to my to my clients. You should have a target asset allocation range. You know, let's say your range is sixty to seventy percent equities. Um, if you're following this this target model, then you're forcing yourself to buy low and sell high, which is exactly what you want to do. In fact, when I was in graduate school. Um, getting my doctorate in finance, one of the management professors asked me, you know, why are you majoring in finance? All you need to know is buy low and sell high, which, you know, was a joke. But of course, if you follow the asset allocation model, you're actually doing that. Because when the market falls, you're below your target, you're forcing yourself to buy stocks. When the market rises, you're above your target, you're forcing yourself to trim and get back into that area. So it was very challenging this year uh, to try to convince some of my clients to not only stay in the market after that sell off in March, but to even add to their positions. Um, and now I'm having the opposite problem where I think it might be time to do some trimming. But of course, everybody sees the market going higher and they want to stay fully invested. Yeah, that's that, you're right. So much. I'm oh, sorry, James, but I, I wrote about yeah. that. My third chapter of the book I wrote is all about the opposite. And I use in there the, the Seinfeld skit from the 90s where George was doing had the opposite of what he really wanted to do. But the point is that investors, when you look at all these studies, Morningstar or Dalbar, all the fund flows are exactly mistimed. You know, the, the maximum flows come into these funds when they're at their peak and they're, they're flowing out of them at their trough. And this is a consistent, consistent behavior that investors have. I mean, it goes back decades. Yeah, I was, I was, I was earlier trying to ask a question that looks like a trick question or, or a cynical question, but, but no, no, there is sincerity in my, in my wanting to know why is self-control so difficult? Baha. Well, or even take, Mike, if you want to add to it later. You know, as I mentioned in, uh, in the book, uh, even Buffett isn't perfect. Um, it takes a lot of intestinal fortitude to, to buy stocks when everybody else is scared and they're selling. So it's it's very difficult to discipline yourself and, and make sure that you're doing what's in your best best interest in the long run and not necessarily reacting to short term swings in the market. No, I, I agree. I mean, it's it's easy to buy when everybody else is buying. Uh, it feels comfortable. Uh, we used to always joke when we'd go, you know, at a, at a, at a scheme and there'd be a big line at one of the lifts. Oh, this must be the good lift. Yeah, it's, everybody seems to rush to the one lift when you've got one next to it that's empty. Um, it, it's just sort of a human nature. They want to be belong, be part of what other people are doing, and they're, they're more comfortable in that environment. 
actually, I have one another question for the two of you, but first going to Vaha. Does it, is it really true, which I, I believe my answer is yes, that, that people, uh, individuals, do need a good advisor, because just in case self-control is wanting, <laughs> then you um, need you know, the advisor to hold you down, to, like, um, to kind of say, they're there, don't panic. Yeah, I think I think you have a good point. I think a um, I think almost everybody could uh, benefit from an advisor, but people also need to learn uh, how to interact with their advisor. Um, oh. In mind that an advisor is not a stockbroker. You don't simply call up your advisor and say, "Buy this, buy that," or "Give me a good good hot stock to buy now." An advisor is focused more on things like uh, diversification, asset allocation, making investment decisions for you over over the long run and so if you're the kind of person who wants to call somebody um, regularly and uh, you know tell them what you're thinking about the market and what you think you should buy or sell um, I would I would say you know what keep a little bit of your money on the side and, and do it yourself with that money the money you give an advisor just trust your advisor he's the professional he's making the decisions and if you're not willing to do that then then perhaps you should think twice about whether you should be using an advisor or not it, that's a great point because people don't realize that investing is a full-time profession and mm -hmm. I, I i can't tell you how many people i'll talk to that they'll spend more time trying to pick out the movie they're going to watch that night <laughs> than what they're going to do with the retirement plan I mean, it's it's really it's it's pretty amazing. Uh, they they don't know how to to invest it, so they're just sort of making whimsical decisions. You know, I, I would call it. Right, right. You know, I always tell my clients that you know investing involves uh, three pieces: asset allocation, diversification, and security selection. And security selection turns out to be the least important of those pieces. Mm -hmm. And people don't like to spend much time thinking about how much of their money should be in stocks or bonds or cash. They think it's a lot more fun to, you know, decide whether I should buy Tesla or Apple or what this week. Uh, and it is more fun, but uh, um, it's not in your best interest to focus on that over the long term. Well, I I think that we have maybe a minute or two. Uh, so how about, Bahan, if there's something you want to uh, tell the viewers of Money Matters TV, uh, either about yourself or about your firm, what would that be, briefly? Um, gee, well, uh, well, I guess I'll talk a little bit more about my firm. Uh, we are in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, we have approximately uh, 250 uh, um, uh, accounts with uh, primarily individual high net worth clients. We do manage money for some institutions, uh, particularly uh, nonprofit organizations um, and uh, endowments. Um, we are a, uh, what we stress all the time, and I think this is critical in the industry, we are an independent financial advisor. And because we are re SEC registered, we are fiduciaries. We are required to do what's in the best interest of the client and not necessarily what's in the best interest for, for us. Very good. Mike, last word from you. Uh, have 15 seconds. <laughs> I, I think I think I think some of the points that uh, Vahan made that were the, the most important is, you know, keep the emotions out of the investing process. If you can't do that yourself, have somebody do it for you. Um, it's a professional occupation. Don't don't toy around with it. This is wisdom. I absolutely agree. Uh, this has been a wonderful show. Uh, our next guest is going to be Maria Maccacini. She has a PhD, and not only that, she is the CEO and founder of her company, Novus Bio Inc. Thank you for watching Money Matters TV.